Welcome to Fortune Forecasts. I am Daisy Raisler, your hostess, and thank you for joining me. We are going through the pages of Wallace D. Waddle's book titled The Science of Getting Rich. It was published in 1910 and it is in the public domain. Recapping chapter 13. Even though the topic was about getting into the right business, and I believe that for many of us, that is a challenge. Um, some are very gifted and, and some people are lucky. They know from a very young age what they want to do and what that right business is. And some of us, on the other hand, we are like tumbleweeds and we just uh, do one thing and the next thing and we just get through life. and. We, um, we struggle with that. But um, while I'd like to really ponder on that, I do understand pretty much what he was saying. But I think, in my opinion, that there was a real golden nugget in there. And it was towards the end of the chapter where he mentioned that there is a mind which knows all there is to know. And that you can come into close unity with this mind by faith and purpose to advance in life if you have deep gratitude. But the one part that I really, really thought was really the best part was where he added that the right motive is one where it adds more life to all and less to none. And I think that that's really what it is. If, if we look to do things that are going to bring more value to life instead of taking from others, which I think that's what he means when he talks about that competitive, that competitive attitude. Uh, I mean, while I personally believe that it's, it's healthy in, in a sense that, you know, competing with yourself, you know, you go into an industry or in an arena or an area where you find out who's doing what you want to do and instead of trying to knock them off their the game it's really to really honor that person and admire what they've done to get with what they're going but you do your thing in your own unique way not seeking to take anything but to bring value greater value to your community and to what you're bringing to the table and defining that that's how i see it i don't really think that there's competition have you ever thought about Maybe this is just me, but ever see where there's a McDonald's and then you look across the other intersection and there's either another fast food, whether it's Burger King, Wendy's, Popeye's, whatever it is, you know, or KFC. But there's usually another, you know, restaurant or fast food right across the street and there's no competition. In one of my neighboring towns, there's a Publix a supermarket in one corner and on the other corner there's a Aldi's supermarket and the both parking lots are full so there is no competition it's about bringing value to people and I, and I, I think that to me that was the biggest takeaway from chapter 13 let me know what you thought and what do you think about my observations okay let's move on to chapter 14 the impression of increase. Whether you change your vocation or not, your actions for the present must be those pertaining to the business in which you are now engaged. You can get into the business you want by making constructive use of the business you are already established in by doing your daily work in a certain way. And in so far as your business consists in dealing with other men, whether personally or by letter, the key thought of all your efforts must be to convey to their minds the impression of increase. Increase is what all men and all women are seeking. It is the urge of the formless intelligence within them, seeking fuller expression. The desire for increase is inherent in all nature. It is the fundamental impulse of the universe. All human activities are based on the desire for increase. People are seeking more food, more clothes, better shelter, more luxury, 
more beauty, more knowledge, more pleasure, increase in something, more life. Every living thing is under this necessity for continuous advancement, where increase of life ceases, dissolution, and death set in at once. Man instinctively knows this, and hence he is forever seeking more. This law of perpetual increase is set forth by Jesus in the parable of the talents. Only those who gain more retain any. From him who hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. The normal desire for increased wealth is not an evil or reprehensible thing. It is simply the desire for more abundant life. It is aspiration. And because it is the deepest instinct of their natures, all men and women are attracted to him who can give them more of the means of life. In following the certain way, as described in the foregoing pages, you are getting continuous increase for yourself, and you are giving it to all with whom you deal. You are a creative center from which increase is given off to all. Be sure of this and convey assurance of the fact to every man, woman, and child with whom you come in contact. No matter how small the transaction, even if it be only the selling of a stick of candy to a little child, put into it the thought of increase and make sure that the customer is impressed with the thought. Convey the impression of advancement with everything you do so that all people shall receive the impression that you are an advancing man and that you advance all who deal with you, even to the people whom you meet in a social way. Without any thought of business and to whom you do not try to sell anything, Give the thought of increase. You can convey this impression by holding the unshakable faith that you yourself are in the way of increase. And by letting this faith inspire, fill, and permeate every action. Do everything that you do in the firm conviction that you are an advancing personality and that you are giving advancement to everybody. Feel that you are getting rich and that in so doing you are making others rich and conferring benefits on all. Do not boast or brag of your success or talk about it unnecessarily. True faith is never boastful. Whenever you find a boastful person, you find one who is secretly doubtful and afraid. Simply feel the faith and let it work out in every transaction. Let every act and tone and look express the quiet assurance that you are getting rich, that you are already rich. Words will not be necessary to communicate this feeling to others. They will feel the sense of increase when in your presence and will be attracted to you again. You must so impress others that they will feel that in associating with you, they will get increase for themselves. See that you give them a use value greater than the cash value you are taking from them. Take an honest pride in doing this and let everybody know it, and you will have no lack of customers. People will go where they are, give an increase, and the supreme which desires increase in all, and which knows all, will move toward you, men and women who have never heard of you. Your business will increase rapidly, and you will be surprised at the unexpected benefits which will come to you. You will be able from day to day to make larger combinations, secure greater advantages, and to go into a more congenial vocation if you desire to do so. But in doing all this, you must never lose sight of your vision of what you want. 
or your faith and purpose to get what you want. Let me here give you another word of caution in regard to motives. Beware of the insidious temptation to seek for power over other men. Nothing is so pleasant to the unformed or partially developed mind as the exercise of power or dominion over others. The desire to rule for selfish gratification has been the curse of the world. For countless ages, kings and lords have drenched the earth with blood in their battles to extend their dominions. This not to seek more life for all, but to get more power for themselves. Today, the main motive in the business and industrial world is the same. Men marshaled their armies of dollars and lay waste the lives and hearts of millions in the same mad scramble for power over others. Commercial kings, like political kings, are inspired by the lust for power. Jesus saw in this desire for mastery the moving impulse of that evil world he sought to overthrow. Read the 23rd chapter of Matthew and see how he pictures the lust of the Pharisees to be called master, to sit in the high places, to domineer over others, and to lay burdens on the backs of the less fortunate. And note how he compares this lust for dominion with the brotherly seeking for the common good to which he calls his disciples. Look out for the temptation to seek for authority, to become a master, to be considered as one who is above the common herd, to impress others by lavish display, and so on. The mind that seeks for mastery over others is the competitive mind. And the competitive mind is not the creative one. In order to master your environment and your destiny, it is not at all necessary that you should rule over your fellow men. And indeed, when you fall into the world's struggle for the high places, you begin to be conquered by fate and environment, and your getting rich becomes a matter of chance and speculation. Beware of the competitive mind. No better statement of the principle of creative action can be formulated than the favorite declaration of the late golden rule, Jones of Toledo. What I want for myself, I want for everybody. And this concludes chapter 14. All right, good stuff, right? Let's turn the page and head on to chapter 15.